time from even like the biggest development to the smallest like single family homeowner it's a really good question i don't think that there's really many answers because there's so many things that would that are at play that should be at play right from the federal level to the state level to the local level that need to be helping and giving incentives and finding ways to make this work if you talk to some experts in the field who have designed net zero buildings they're not achieving net zero because operationally people who manage buildings there's an education piece too that's missing and an operational training piece where Right. need to know how to operate it to maximum efficiency as well and know how to, need to know how to work the systems as well. I did notice that um, at the workshop I went to um, that was instructed by Jay Lee and Place Taylors, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the roundtable discussion was about the builders as well as the tenants of these buildings not knowing what net zero is and not knowing how to utilize it um, or build for it. Um, and that's a whole educational process. And a lot of them were a little yeah. skeptical about net zero being the way to go, even though yeah. it had a lot of, of payback um, in the long run, even though the upfront costs are a lot more expensive. Um, but yet the costs in the long run are, are a lot smaller. So from yeah. what I was just reading from that room, are most people in the housing industry, you think, you know, looking at this as the industry future, or is there still a little bit of, of hesitation? Uh, I mean, I think that, I think it's definitely starting to trickle down into, and it's a lot, you know, architects consider those issues all the time, and I think that, you know, with net zero, there's sort of all these different standards and sort of trying to fit in like both the financial feasibility for their clients and you know the regulatory building code and energy codes and sort of I think there's a lot of moving parts so that I think I think that the community as a whole is still in an education process but even those that are well educated on it you know it's 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 a lot of give and take to figure out how to get there and what sort of what's the best goal for each each development <sighs> Well, I think it, I mean, the affordability challenge is a huge one. And when you talk about, you know, places outside of the city of Boston and affordable housing, they've not really kept up their share of it. Um, I think that Boston has a lot of good innovation happening and a lot of will to build what is necessary. I think it's, you know, a really big challenge. And I think that with the net zero, I think it's something that neighborhood by neighborhood and municipality by municipality is important. But overall for like the global you know the global look at that it's 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 a hard environment right now in our country and just all around the world to get there right the city of cambridge is um, affordable housing trust fund that trust fund is um uh, and again the people in housing might be the better downstairs might be better at explaining this but you know that trust fund is then um, used to um, have affordable housing, nonprofit housing developers build affordable housing. Um, the, the nonprofit affordable housing developers that Cambridge works with a lot are really at the cutting edge of, of, of being energy efficient and using renewable energy and, and getting towards net zero. Um, because what they, what they know and what sort of anyone, anyone who runs a building knows is that, um, but especially in the affordable housing region, it, it's that if they can build a building that's energy efficient, where when they're running that building as a landlord, they're not spending a lot of money on electricity and natural gas, then they actually have more funds to put into more new affordable housing, right? They reduce, uh, energy efficiency, renew renewable energy reduces your operating costs for that asset. And so that means that rather than spending all that money just operating one asset, you actually have money left over to go invest in a new asset. And so that new asset is more affordable housing. And I think it also makes them less, a net zero home makes these affordable housing developers less subject to the market changes, right? So if you know that your building is sort of net zero and self-sufficient, <laughs> um, you can really predict the cost of your energy over the lifetime of that asset. Whereas when natural gas prices go up and down, it's very hard to predict that cost, which can make making future investments in new properties more challenging, right? Because you're like, well, I might need this cash 10 years from now to pay for for a high, you know, high, high natural gas bills in a 
cold winter. So it's also about the net zero really creates predictability so that those investments can get made. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's really, I think, where net zero and affordability come together the best is when we can give affordable housing developers sort of when they can make essentially more money for themselves to invest in more affordable housing. You know, it depends on how you look at it. The initial cost may be a little bit higher, but not that much. And you know, you're saving on a lot of equipment. Uh, heat pumps don't need, you know, with ductless heat pumps, you don't need ducts, you don't need uh, a separate AC system, cooling from heating, you know, so there's a lot of savings on some of it. So when you, when you add it all up and the insulation pays back year after year after year because you're not you're saving on energy costs overall regardless of what you're using and if you're using free energy from the sun uh you're you're really uh dramatically saving on energy right away yeah okay. and in massachusetts there's incentives various incentives and very complicated uh, business to figure out all the things depending on where you live but in many cases you, people are making money uh with solar you know, once you start with the free energy from the, on the roof or in the yard, if you do a ground mount, uh, you've got a lot of options. A few, the, you know, it's not quite as cut and dried. If they're not owner occupied, you know, the incentives aren't that great. You know, they're, they're, you know financing is another issue. I mean, there's tax credits and there's depreciation, but, you know, if somebody's renting, it's kind of hard to control who's using the, the power and, you know, and, and the like. So that's complicated, you know, and, and sort of a, a difficult business model. Uh, but if it's owner occupied, that's a little different, you know, and, and maybe you don't have to get all of the, all of the bill covered of all the units in a multifamily. Uh, you may only go the common area plus the owner who has one unit out of three, something like that. Uh, that's typical. That, that can be done easily. It's when you're trying to do all three that, that get, things get complicated because you know, you have to incentivize the people who are using the power that are not paying for it, if they're not paying for it. How, how do they be conserved? How do they, you know, incentivize them to be conservative? A lot of times you're going to have to get uh, the solar somewhere other than that particular building, you know, because you're limited in the, the real estate. So the community solar aspects may be good. Uh, you also have um, um, the ability to maybe just talk about the heating and cooling and, and not necessarily use the solar on the roof, you know. Uh, you know, that's not net zero, but, you know, then there's, there's obviously some arguments to be made about where does our, you know, there's some, some other ways, but if you can reduce your overall energy, you're still helping.